Welcome to another episode of the Bandage Podcast, a weekly wrap-up of the most trending healthcare news. Each week, we'll discuss the latest in healthcare, health IT, and compliance. In this week's episode, we discuss an abnormal number of child death in the UK, a breakthrough study explaining why we get more colds in the winter, and students suing Yale for mental illness discrimination. Let's wrap things up. This is episode 164 for the week of December 12th. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Albert Bettistelli. Before we get started, our diagnosis code of the week is Y92.253, or Opera House, as the place of occurrence of the external cause. Yikes. Cool. Is this the diagnosis code that Abraham Lincoln had? Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) Too soon, too soon. He was an American patriot. One of the greatest presidents of all time, but it still is a question to ask. That's true. I bet this was his diagnosis code. If ICD, what ICD version do you think it, it was when Abraham Lincoln was around? No, who knows? ICD one, one, one. yeah, original. <laughs> the OG, OG ICD. Yeah, OG what if, ICD. That, what, what if this is the first ever diagnosis code because of that? Oh, that would be incredible. Whoa! Did we just Did crack the code? With- they like sat down and they were like, what are we going to, what's, what should we do? And they wrote like Y92.253. <laughs> that was just they what went, came to it. their mind. First it one. Just, <laughs> there was some doctor and he just yep. wrote it and it was just, and they yep. were like, oh my gosh. We have to make a bunch <laughs> this of guys these guys brilliant. Yep. I'm just, we're just kidding guys. Nothing had to do. I don't think ICD-10 had to do with Abraham Lincoln's assassination, but you know. It's a good discussion point. Anyways, uh, first up, we've got Drep A causing deaths. The UK's health security agency issued a rare health warning two weeks ago, urging parents to monitor their children for telltale symptoms of Strep A, which can include a sore throat, headache, fever, and body rashes. At least six children have died of severe cases of the infection since September, while reported cases have risen over 4.5 times the amount seen in recent years. Five of the deaths occurred in children under the age of 10 in England. The sixth death was reported by Public Health Wales. Last week, the death of a 12-year-old schoolboy from London was reported, but has not yet been linked to Strep A. To illustrate the severity of the situation, typically only one or two children under the age of 10 die as a result of Strep A during winter in the UK. Health officials have said there is currently no evidence that a new strain is circulating. The increase is instead likely related to high amounts of circulating bacteria in social mixing following the end of COVID-19 restrictions. Oh. I did wonder about that, like everyone just being at home for that for that long in their own germs, and then all of a sudden... New germs, yeah. Yeah. Body's not used to it. Body can't body, it. body and not used to it. Yeah. It is scary, though. I mean, I feel like strep is fairly common, so to know that like something that is typically not fatal is suddenly proving to be a little bit more aggressive and even killing people. That's, I don't know, gives you pause anyway. Anytime you have a little sore throat now or your kids have a little sore throat, I'm sure you're like, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it is, a, it is, it's scary for sure. Yeah. I wonder, did, did COVID-19 restrictions just, just stop in the UK? I don't think so. I think it's been I think it's been a little while, but I don't know for sure. Let me see. Do-do-do. Let's see, July nineteenth, twenty twenty one. So it's almost been a year. Or it's been yeah. more than a year. A year and a half. So Well, even over here you can see like the flu is way worse this year than true. it's been in a long time. That's true. Rut row. <laughs> Rut row. It's like there's like got? a lag or something in getting sick. So, mm-hmm. all right. Explaining the sniffles. In what researchers are calling a scientific breakthrough, scientists behind a new study may have found the biological reason we get more respiratory illnesses in winter. It turns out the cold air itself damages the immune response occurring in the nose. In fact, reducing the temperature inside the nose by as little as nine degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius kills nearly 50% of the virus and bacteria-fighting cells in the nostrils. In other words, you've essentially lost half of your immunity just by that small drop in temperature. 
It's important to remember that the findings are from in vitro studies, meaning that although it is using human tissue in the lab to study this immune response, it is not a study being carried out inside someone's actual nose. Often the findings of in vitro studies are confirmed in vivo, but not always. I've always That's had crazy. like, why is it called a cold? Doesn't like, what does temperature have to do with this? <laughs> That's like, true. But now we I never know. asked myself that question, but it makes sense as to why that question would exist. Cause I was just like, I guess it's just called the cold. Yeah. I don't feel cold, but right. Yikes. But my nose is super inflamed. So or... is this like a business idea then make a little nose warmer? Oh yeah. Keep your mm. nose. I would like it. Do something like that. Don't let your nose degree. Don't let the, your nose temperature drop. I wonder how you can stop your nose from from dropping the temperature in your nose dropping. A little hat that you wear on your nose. It's like that. Yeah, it's like a little (laughs) a little like a party hat. hat. It's like a party (laughs) hat, but you like wear it back to front, and you put the little cone part over your nose. But it's or it's just a a red clown nose. Yes, just wear that. Which makes me wonder: Do clowns get have a reduced risk of getting the cold because of their nose covering? Wow. I mean, Whoa. logically, that makes sense. I feel like that could be the next big study. Yeah. Someone Maybe we'll cover that one day. For that, yeah. Someone who's who's trying to get a PhD and needs to make their dissertation. Looks like we just gave you the oh, entire there topic. Yep. Whoa. Whoa. Next up, demanding prestigious reform. A lawsuit filed last Wednesday accused Yale University of discriminating against students with mental health issues. The 41-page lawsuit was filed by a Yale student mental health group and two current Yale undergraduates on behalf of all Yale students who have suffered from mental health disabilities. The plaintiffs allege that students who withdraw from Yale due to mental health reasons face harsher standards by the university. The lawsuit claims that Yale's mental health policy will violate the Americans with Disability Act, the Affordable Care Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Fair Housing Act. The plaintiffs mm-hmm. denied seeking financial compensation. They requested that Yale make further reforms to its mental health policies. Huh. Wow, they don't even want financial compensation? Nope. They just That's want... kind of a big thing. That is. They just want more awareness or more... That's a big takeaway. That is a big takeaway. It's like, we're not in it for the money. We just want you to do better. It almost sounded like the, the lead up to that store to that was like, it was going to have financial return because it was like Yale students, Yale group, Yale, you know what I mean? And especially like in this day and age, you kind of just have that negative, like they're going to want money from this just right. out the gate because, you know, social reform is great, but usually civil lawsuits are the leading thing is, is money. So I wonder if they're going to have a hard time finding a lawyer to do this lawsuit. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. Because as we know, Albert, every lawyer has the best person at heart. Just kidding. Sure. Yeah, you're right. They're all very... They're all very altruistic. It's It's all about both sides. Right, no, for real. Maybe they'll find someone who wants to do some pro bono. But that's cool. Pro bono. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Yale comes to the agreement yeah. with the Yale students and the Yale group and Yale. Yale, Always. Yale better come to this conclusion. Yeah. You know, college students struggle with mental health issues a lot. Yes. More than others, just because it's a stressful time in your life and first time away from the family or from home for a lot of people. Yep figuring out who you are. That's, that's hard. So hopefully they can who am I? help there. And with that, let's go to our next segment. B R E A C H breach patrol. It's a breach. All of the latest cybersecurity breaches. Welcome to breach patrol. We talk about the latest breaches all across the world. Oh my gosh. What do we got? All right. It's breach of password safe house. Last pass, a major password manager says that it suffered its second breach in three oh. months by the same unauthorized party. The LastPass CEO announced that the company detected unusual activity within a third-party cloud storage service, but that customers' passwords remain safely encrypted. The first breach happened when an unauthorized party gained access to parts of the LastPass development environment. 
which did not contain customer data during a four-day period in August. There was no evidence of access to customer data. Three months later, the same party used the information it gained in August to access certain elements of customers' information for a second breach. The oh, CEO man. maintains that passwords are safely encrypted despite the recent breach. So LastPass is a password management solution where you put all your passwords for all your accounts in it, and it sure. tells you when you log in. A lot of browsers have that kind of natively now. Yeah. But <clears throat> LastPass says that it's not as, you know, they're not as, LastPass is more secure because it encrypts passwords. So hopefully that what the CEO is saying is is true. Right. Because that would be really scary. It's like, I trust this organization to have all my passwords and all of my account information for everything that I use in the world. Yep. And if that, you know, if, it, if, if someone gets their hands on that, then that's bad. But, you know, I, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really say what information. No, it doesn't. It doesn't give a lot of details. Which makes me kind of apprehensive as to, you know, are they trying to cover this up? Right. The veracity of all of it is kind of called into question, but. I don't know. I guess on the I surface, guess we'll have to follow up on this. Well, one. yeah, we'll just have to keep following it. Next up, conclusion of Experian T-Mobile lawsuit. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton announced that his office, along with a coalition of other state attorney generals, obtained settlements of more than $16 million with Experian Data Corporation, Experian Information Solutions, and T-Mobile. In September of 2015, Experian reported a data breach that impacted more than 15 million people who submitted credit applications with an Experian client. T-Mobile. Nearly 2 million Texans were exposed in the breach, and the state of Texas will collect approximately $1.63 million of the total settlement's funds. In addition to the funds paid to the state, Experian Information Solutions, T-Mobile, and Experian Data Corporation have agreed to compliance terms to strengthen consumer protections. Mm -hmm. This is what we're seeing more of. Whoa! Lawsuits and payouts, and that's the end result of some of these breaches. Yeah, there's a lot of organizations in cahoots here yeah that's true yeah so who's who so settled credit applications with an experienced client t-mobile huh. huh whoa so it seems like t-mobile was the one breach that trickled down or was Experian the one who got breached and it trickled down to t-mobile uh, i'm not sure how what the connection between Experian and t-mobile would be but Someone's selling data to one of the one of the companies. Either T-Mobile selling data to Experian or Experian selling t data to T-Mobile. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be what it is. Right. But 1.63 million is nothing to scoff at. No, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> As I scoff at it. Scoff, scoff, <laughs> scoff, scoff. Interesting. Well, definitely a warning sign for those who are lax and their consumer protection stuff. Make sure you get up on that. Don't want to breach. Don't want to pay all that money. Not good. Not good. All right. Next up, Twitter under wraps. A Los Angeles-based cybersecurity expert has warned of a data breach at social media site Twitter that has allegedly affected millions across the U.S. and EU. The expert took to social media on November 23rd to warn users of the alleged data breach that he claims occurred no earlier than 2021 and has not been reported before. The expert said that any Twitter account with the, quote, let others find you by phone number, unquote, setting, enabled in its discoverability settings is affected with all accounts for the entire country code of France listed with their full mobile numbers. Wee oui, wee. Oui. That's all I have to oui, say oui. about this. No, no. Twitter has been getting hit hard with a bunch of stuff like this. Oh, Twitter. It's just chaos over there right now there's like two people running the whole thing there's like a <laughs> mouse on, there's like a mouse on a wheel that keeps the lights on i have no idea like meanwhile what's going on. they're getting breached left and right all right it's not good it's not good for business no well you know hopefully wish them the best I, not all do you can we, do i don't wish twitter the best honestly <laughs> let it let it fall let it crumble let it crumble something else will come I'm okay. up I'm okay with the end of Twitter. It's a very, it's, it's a, a very fairly toxic kind of social very media, toxic to be place. It is very toxic. It, it is. I agree with and you. And it's pretty gross. Like, get rid of it. 
I got rid of Twitter a little bit ago. Not that that makes me better than everybody else, but it does. <laughs> I'm just Not that makes it better than everybody else, but low-key it does. But low-key it does, because Twitter sucks. And that's it for this week's wrap-up of your weekly healthcare news. I'm Matt Penny, And I'm Bob Robertis-Delli. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Bandage Podcast produced by eTactics.